Hi and welcome back to the second part of today's program, The Game Changers Finding Commercial Impetus. We will look at who is doing what right now regarding the vessel, the technology and the fuel supply, both on ammonia, ammonia and hydrogen. Now, um, there's uh, not too much activity in the chat, so if, uh, if you wanted to write in the chat, we'd be uh, pleased to forward either your questions or your thoughts. And uh, Craig, this is your... Uh, this is your part, you will moderate this part, so I will just leave uh, the studio to you. Great, thank you very much there. And um, yes, what we're going to be doing over the next um, hour basically is having a, a journey across the whole stakeholder chain within the hydrogen story. We're going to spend a period looking at the vessel, we're going to spend a, a conversation looking at the technology that we're going to use, and then we're going to look separately at the ammonia supply chain and infrastructure and hydrogen supply chain and infrastructure. So this first part of the discussion, um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Jan Egberton from the port of Amsterdam, Andre Rizholm from Amon Maritime, and Steiner Madsen, who's head of Topeka within um, Wilhelmsen. Um, the latter two, of course, being Norwegian, are in the studio there. I can see them there sat on chairs. And uh, Jan, you're from the port of Amsterdam, so like, like me, you're joining us um, remotely through your, your webcam. Um, but I'm actually going to start with you, if I can, Jan, because I want this discussion just to look a little bit on the... I'm going to take the journey in terms of size a little bit, but also from a point of view, people probably understand a little bit more about why the port of Amsterdam is in this discussion where we're talking about the ships because you are in the process, you've got a project where you're developing um, a vessel that you're going to run off of hydrogen. And I just wanted you to, to explain that a little bit because I know that the fuel you're using isn't what everybody started to talk about when they talk about hydrogen. We're having conversations about hydrogen, we're having conversations about ammonia, but you're, you've picked a different kind of fuel, haven't you, for this vessel? Yes, well, <clears throat> the vessel is our representation vessel that we use to um, sail our gas through the port of Amsterdam and the canals of Amsterdam. Uh, it's a ship of 30 meters length, so it's a relatively small ship, but it's going to sail on an uh, electrical engine, a battery pack, and sodium borehydride as a hydrogen carrier. Uh, this is a European project H2 Ships, and Northwest Europe uh, is the sponsor of that interact project. And the idea is that if you use sodium borehydride, you have a better energy density than if you would use a gasified form of hydrogen. At the same time, it's much more safer than if you use, for instance, ammonia, especially if you have a ship where there are passengers on board. That's quite a challenge hmm. if you're going to use ammonium. Uh, we so, so what is sodium borehydride? Just, just quickly, can you tell me what is sodium borehydride? Is it, is it, is it a solid? Is it um, like coal? Is it a... Can you put it into an end, into a fuel cell like liquid? What, what exactly is it and how is it used? Uh, it's a solid uh, white powdery substance. It consists of sodium borehydride. And if you mix it with water and a catalyzer, it uh, sends out, as it were, the hydrogen. And the hydrogen itself goes to the electrolyzer. And, and you're, you're looking at developing this project in, it, in its entirety. So what time frames do you have for actually getting this vessel into the water? Uh, we have done the hazard test with uh, large register and the design is ready for the ship and for the engine parts and the catalyst. Um, it was quite difficult because you have to fit it all in a relatively small area. So there are a lot of barges at the moment in the Netherlands who have much more space, but they are looking at the possibility to apply this also for their ships. Uh, the ship is going on the wharf to be built this summer and will sail somewhere next year. And, and of course, we're not, we're not talking about a very a large vessel here. I know this conversation that we're going to be having over this course of today is going to scale from the kind of um, passenger vessel that you've got in the port of Amsterdam to some of the larger vessels that are going to need to either be built or convert to use um, clean fuels. But you're not only looking at this smaller vessel. I know when, I, when I've looked at the port of Amsterdam, you're involved in a number of other projects, including in the inland waterways, aren't you? How advanced is the work to actually use hydrogen, ammonia, or what kind of fuels in the inland waterways around Europe? I think if you talk about inland waterways, the focus will be about uh, hydrogen and about 
uh, methanol, be it bio or synthetic methanol. I don't think that in inland shipping they're going to use ammonia because of the risks you have when you start to bunker uh, these type of fuels. Um, I have the feeling that ammonia is made of more fuel for the long distance uh, seagoing vessels. So if you look at short sea, especially also barges, it's more a mix of sometimes even electric engines, electric fueling, okay. uh, gentrified hydrogen, hydrogen in the carrier form like LEOH. And okay, so, it, that, so what, what you're saying is there's a lot of different types of fuels that could be used um, yes. around, but, but probably not ammonia. And that kind of goes in line with what we've heard um, from some other uh, speakers earlier today who see ammonia being potentially a more deep sea solution. Um, I'm going to turn now to, to Steiner, Steiner Madsen, head of uh, Topeka, because I, I just wanted to now just bring you into this conversation because the vessels, the two vessels, I believe that you're going to be building, two coastal vessels, two railroad vessels, they're going to be used, aren't they, for the transportation of uh, fuels around the coast as well as cargoes as well. Could you explain the rationale behind Topeka's vessels? Um, I know you've got about 219 million knock funding for this to, to push you ahead, but what's your plans for this vessel, these vessels on a commercial scale once you've got them built? Yes, thank you. The Topeka project for, for the vessels on the southwest coast of Norway is, is, a, is a project to, to introduce zero emission shipping or zero emission transport, uh, of course, to, to meet the need for decarbonization. But in the first phase, we believe it's very important to cooperate with the, en uh, with the energy companies to develop the, the complete uh, value chain for the new fuels. So the Topeka base-to-base -base vessels are uh, uh, included part in, in a larger project uh, together with uh, uh, Equinor and Air Liquid, where they are planning to build a factory for liquid hydrogen. And uh, the Topeka vessel will then be fueled uh, from the factory but also be a part of the distribution chain for the factory to uh, transport uh, liquid hydrogen as a cargo to other ports on the west coast of Norway, and thereby uh, helping to introduce uh, uh, hydrogen hubs uh, at the ports to, to start uh, rolling out the, the new uh, energy uh, forms. And I think this is, this is an important point here, as we see this evolution of the industry, that you're building a vessel, but having it to have conversations with the fuel suppliers at the same time it's it's at this point it's not about just building a vessel and saying hoping that somebody's going to be able to use it and supply the fuel it's a much more collaborative process isn't it you're having to talk to equinor you're having to talk to any potential fuel supplier you're having to talk to a number of different organizations in this process is it do you see this evolving quickly so it becomes a much more normal shipbuilding process, for want of a better way of saying it, and less of a project by project? Yes, hopefully, but w we need some demonstration projects to, to prove the concepts and, and prove it's possible. But it's, it's a classic chicken and egg dilemma. It's more or less the same as for LNG 20, 25 years ago. And, and to be able to start it running, I think it's uh, critical to, to combine uh, both the, the uh, supplier of energy uh, the end user and, and the ship owners and, and together we need to find a way to solve it because the technology part is, is uh, we believe it's feasible to, to make uh, vessels using liquid hydrogen and, and as you mentioned we have been very fortunate and been supported by EU uh, from uh, Horizon 2020 funding high ship and also from the Norwegian government uh, in Ova. So we have a lot of support uh, for, for doing the investment. But the main issue for the time being is to make a, a business model because the fuel production will be a very small pilot and, and the cost for hydrogen at this very small uh, scale is, is, uh, is a difficult. So we are spending most of the time trying to make a business model together with the end user, together with the factory uh, to start, uh, start uh, LNG2 as, as, a, as a fuel to, to start rolling. Do you think Norway generally learned a lot by the chicken and egg scenario that it saw with the development of LNG as a fuel? Was that a very good lesson that the, the country's shipping community learned and is able to apply now as it evolves um, these zero emission fuels? 
Yes, and, and I, I really hope we learn something because uh, the LNG started 20, 25 years ago. So maybe hydrogen today is what LNG was 20, 25 years ago. And of course, uh, with, the, with the ambitions for zero emission in 2050, we, are, have, we don't have the opportunity that same slow pace. So hopefully we have learned some lessons and can speed up the process this time. Yeah, that was kind of what I was thinking of. We don't have the same length of time. <laughs> That's true. Let me, let me turn now to Andre. Andre, your goals, your ambitions are some of the most ambitious that I've seen in a, in a, in a while, because you're not only going for a zero emission vessel, you want to build a whole fleet, and you're kind of confident that you can do so on the capital cost side at a reasonably good competitive price compared to existing vessels today. You've formed Amon Maritime and through that, you've got this joint venture, Viridis Bulk Carriers, and the objective here is to build a fleet. Why do you, why do you feel it's necessary to build a fleet of vessels to operate around in coastal waters rather than going for individual one ship, which I've seen a lot of projects focusing on individual ships with individual charterers. They've come up with a, you know, a good solid partnership, a good arrangement, good collab collaboration. But you want to build up more like a fleet of four, five, six vessels, perhaps. Yeah, it's uh, it's all about uh, what Steiner said here about finding a viable business model, uh, right? And and this uh, short sea boat market, uh, the way it operates is uh, usually through contracts of a freightment, uh, spot market, and so on. So you really need to set up a zero emission bulk transport network uh, to be able to offer clients a service uh, that they demand. And, and of course, uh, custom demonstration projects uh, are, are needed, uh, but to really get the, to build a foundation for building a large fleet, uh, we believe we have to offer clients uh, what they use uh, today, which are uh, vessels with a meaningful operational range and also not having to charter vessels on time charter, but uh, being able to, to purchase a service, transporting goods from A to B, uh, but now uh, without CO2 emissions. And um, why are you so sure that you can actually build the vessels at a competitive cost compared to what vessels today would cost if they're built with an ordinary uh, internal combustion engine running on a uh, diesel fuel or uh, something like that and a carbon emitting mm. fuel effectively why do you think you could build that at a, at a competitive price and then going on to that next question apart from that is the operational costs because Steiner was talking about the cost of the fuel. If you've got a higher cost, you're not going to be able to operate it at a competitive price either. We, we believe that uh, initially, uh, for the early movers, uh, like we intend to be, uh, there will be a slight uh, cost premium, but it will mainly be related to the fuel. Uh, when you look at vessel capex, uh, we, we are probably looking at a slightly higher, uh, higher cost to build, but we are looking at internal combustion engines, we are looking at uh, uh, ammonia tank systems and so on, which is uh, fairly uh, standard uh, components. So, so there will be a cost increase by using these components in a new way and uh, doing it for the first time uh, and so on. Uh, so a slight uh, cost premium here is necessary, but, uh, but not on a multiple uh, type of scale. Uh, we, we want to be uh, competitive on, on price and we do believe that uh, in time and not very long time uh, we will also be able to, to win on price uh, but that will be driven by uh, the cost of carbon uh, increasing. Well I was going to come to that because there's, there's a lot of pressure at the moment about a carbon price and I, I daily see uh, statements from ship owners, international deep sea ship owners who are now coming out in support of some sort of carbon price levy, um, something that will um, help with this transition. And we've got the proposals for the European Emission Trading Scheme. You yourself, given the fact that you hope to operate around Europe, must be quite keen on the development of shipping being brought into the European ETS. For, for sure. Uh, we strongly hope that uh, this is going to be implemented uh, sooner rather than later. And also, uh, of course, the, the way that it's implemented, uh, that it's done in a way that's really 
uh, helps uh, drive this change. Uh, because it's, it's really a matter of uh, cost. If you price uh, carbon uh, in a way that other solutions can compete, then this is going to happen. Uh, it, mm. it, it's all about the cost. Yeah. And do you, do you have cargo owners? We're going to talk to some cargo owners later in the day. But do you have cargo owners? Do you have clients that are interested in your vessels? Yes, uh, for sure. We we are uh, building collaborations with uh, with the client partners. Uh, we will be uh, announcing uh, some of those partners uh, shortly. Uh, but what, what we are uh, looking to find is really the the, the top uh, part of the short sea bulk uh, charter market. Uh, the the part of the market that sees a commercial benefit of, uh, of uh, using these solutions uh, in their own business, uh, which I believe are, are quite a few uh, of those, uh, those types of clients. So, so we, we are building collaborations with them, uh, and uh, that, that's going to be the foundation of, uh, of ordering a series of vessels. That's really that, that you're able to, to link up uh, a uh, network of COAs uh, hmm. that can operate efficiently. Great. Can I talk back, turn back to Jan now in the port of Amsterdam? Because when we're talking about the incentives, I know a lot of ports have got incentives to help ship owners um, with their energy transitions, with fuel efficiencies. Uh, there's been a lot of um, programs such as that. But from the port's perspective, from the port's perspective, from the port of Amsterdam, how do you see the transition, and how do you yourself ready yourself for? vessels that might be coming into your port that have a broad range of fuel expectations or fueling expectations? Um, there is a European program uh, <clears throat> in which most ports work together uh, to give a rebate on the harbour dues, depending on how clean or how sustainable your shipping is. And that works on the seaside. I also know that we are working together with others on the inland port side, but uh, the inland harbour dues are relatively very small compared to uh, the sea harbour dues. Uh, besides that, we are working on a program for onshore power supply for the public uh, waiting places. We already have it for the public waiting places in the city area for barges and in the city area for the river cruise. So we're seeing together, possibly with terminals close to the city area, to enlarge in, uh, the locations where you can use onshore power supply. Um, uh, one of the most important issues is, of course, as a port authority, are you ready, as a port region, are you ready to bunker these new fuels? So we have a test location where you can test a new fuel. There's many done by a truck on the key side, and then you can test hydrogen or LNG like we did uh, five years ago. This location uh, will be a new one, and then you can test also other types of fuels. But the main challenge is, of course, uh, which of the fuels will it be in the future? Uh, yesterday I was in a conference in the Netherlands, and there they guessed that there will be three up to five different type of sustainable marine fuels available in ports in the future. So if you want to bunker all of these, uh, as port authority, you have to work closely together with the bunkering companies, those are private companies, to see uh, in a kind of a roadmap, when do you have to have which bunker facility available in your port area. So we have to work very closely together with the shipping industry and the fueling industry. How does it um, develop the coming four or five years? Yeah. Yeah, and I know Steiner from the Topeka project uh, perspective, the Roro vessels that you're going to evolve will be carrying containerized uh, hydrogen, won't they? So that that's the so that the fuel can be transported around the, the Norwegian coastline to where you anticipate that they're going to be needed uh, for maritime use. Is that the case? Yes, and, and we believe that uh, ISPS ports also could be hydrogen hubs for, for other users of hydrogen because there we have a security system. But, but what I believe is uh, the reason why we are using uh, containers is that, that the, from the pilot uh, production sites is very small volumes. But what we need to address is the, the need for, for scaling up the production of the new carbon-free uh, fuels because we know that when, when they are scaled up, the price will be very competitive, most likely.
but we need to find a way to, 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 to make a roadmap from the small production sites to the large sites and, and how to cover the additional cost. And, and you talked about the CO2 levies, and, and maybe that could be a part right of then. the uh, discussion because maybe the levy could also okay, find as a kind yeah. of uh, contract of difference to support the additional cost in, the, in this uh, early f innovative phase for, 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 for the new fuels. I know that there are a lot of developments going on both on the European level and um, on the international level with the IMO because um, there's all the discussions there about fuels, let alone the discussions about the CII and the EEXI about what has to happen with, with existing vessels. But um, can I just quickly, just because we've only got about four minutes left, but Andre, from your perspective, you're looking at building new vessels. What about retrofitting vessels? We've got these rules now that have been very close to coming into force, EE, XI, CII, etc. They may promote some ship owners to go and actually retrofit clean fuels. Why can't you go down that same route? Well, I think the, the, the financial and uh, commercial business case for a rebuilding a vessel has, of course, a lot of variables. Uh, one very important variable is uh, age and the uh, remaining age. Uh, the average age of vessels in this segment that we are, are uh, in with Viridis bulk carriers is close to 30 years. So of course there are young vessels in that fleet, uh, but there is a, a lot of uh, that fleet is going to be replaced uh, anyway. Uh, so, so for sure, uh, there may be good cases for uh, rebuilding vessels. Uh, but oftentimes that's, uh, that's difficult, and uh, especially if the age uh, is already uh, quite extended, then uh, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to make that uh, work financially. Do you anticipate then, having mentioned the age of the vessels, you anticipate that there will be a, a large turnover in terms of the vessels in the short sea shipping fleet in the coming years, and that will help promote that transformation? Oh yes, uh, yes for sure, and uh, you can see all over shipping, not only short sea, but uh, the past 10 years has been very, very low order books uh, in all segments. So we, we believe that uh, when, when uh, we converge towards a solution uh, for both short sea and deep sea shipping, the, the ketchup effect uh, is going to uh, really start uh, working on, on shipyards uh, all over the world uh, because you, you need to catch up just with the age uh, of the world uh, fleets. So we, we believe that the, the eventually the zero emission uh, shipbuilding boom is going to be the largest shipbuilding boom that uh, the, the market has ever seen. Well, that must certainly be whetting a few people's appetites if they um, see that happening across both the technology firms, the shipbuilders, um, and a lot of the integrators as well. We're just coming to the close of this session, so I want to thank our three guests here, Steiner Madsen from Topeka, Andrew Risholm from Amon Maritime, and of course, Jan Egberston in the port of Amsterdam, who's on the link call. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. I appreciate that it is very short and we haven't, hadn't had a lot of time to get into real depth, but hopefully you'll be able to join us in January in 2022 and we can actually get into more detail in person on the stage and really get into depth about what's going on and hopefully got some new information from you over the last six months because I feel that there's a lot happening here on the, in this sector. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Well, I'll be back in about a few seconds, I think, and we're going to be talking to one established engine maker, two fuel cell developers and one integration specialists as we look at the technologies that are going to be needed for the transition of this industry. So straight back after this short break.
tough enough to be on a spacecraft, light enough to be in vehicles. Some call us pioneers or enablers. Our composites technology is at the heart of what we do. And we do it with passion. Because we believe that clean air is a right, not a privilege. The maritime industry is facing new challenges. The time to act is now. Hydrogen from renewable energy, combined with our fuel cells, will support you decarbonizing your vessels without compromising the performance. Our marine fuel cell system is developed to meet the highest marine safety standards. And most importantly, we can provide you with megawatt fuel cell solutions today. With us as a partner, your vessels will have high performance, efficiency, and safe operations with true zero emission. It's time to move to a sustainable shipping. Join the next big wave today.